Hi, I'm Walt Thiessen from the LOA Today podcast. If you've been listening to LOA Today for any length of time, you know that mindset plays a huge role in what we talk about with our guests each day. You know that mindset is something we all need to work on every day. After all, as researchers have discovered, the average human thinks a negative thought 80% of the time during his or her day every day. I've been thinking about that fact recently, asking myself, what can I do to help more people like you to reset your brains the way you want them reset? And I came up with an idea for an experiment, and I want to invite you to participate. I'm calling it the Brain Retrainers Club, and I've scheduled a Zoom meeting for Wednesday, October 19th at 8 p.m. New York time, and you're invited. It's free. To register, just visit loatoday.net forward slash brain. That's B-R-A-I-N, loatoday.net forward slash brain. See you there. Today, I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today is financial advisor Jody Lynn Craven. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And it's kind of an unusual day because we don't actually have a guest today. So, Jody, we, we get to do like the old-fashioned style again, right? Where we just yeah. chat and talk about stuff. Which it's is- just us today. It's yes. Us. Yeah. How exciting. It is. It's kind of fun. It's yeah. like a throwback, throwback Wednesday. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about the fact that here in the U.S., uh, of course, the U.S. is known for uh, unusual sports compared to the rest of the world, including baseball. Um, and this is our, our baseball postseason. So the, the playoffs are in, un, underway. And it kind of threw into my mind, well, one of the – cool cliches that come out of baseball is when life throws you a curve. So I figured, why don't we talk about when life throws you a curve and kind of an honor of what's going on with the postseason. And it's not like we go through life and life never throws us curveballs. So I'm sure we have lots of things we could talk about. Absolutely. And I think that is one of the biggest misconceptions when it comes to personal development or, you know, attracting the things that you want or living a life of abundance or all of these things is that there's this misconception that your life is going to be perfect and nothing bad is ever going to happen. And if it does, then you're doing something wrong. You've got the formula wrong. Right. And that's not it. We live in a world of polarity. We live in this dimension where both exist, that good, that bad, that yin, that yang. So both have to be there. So when they're entering your life, it's not necessarily that you're doing something wrong. Maybe there's something you can learn. Now, I do find, and I'm curious to know what your take is on this, I do find that it is a little disconcerting to me to recognize that when something does come into my life that I in some way attracted it, that Mm -hmm. I played a role in that. On the other hand, If I really look at it objectively, it's not like we go through life in this polarity driven world without ever focusing on anything we don't like. I mean, that's just not, that's not what happens in life. So yeah, of course I did. I, what I have to remind myself is that's not a big deal. (laughs) You, you, You attracted something that you didn't want. Okay. Well, you know, welcome to the world of polarity and, uh, next. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's right. That's I right. think that's a <laughs> great way to put it, Walt, because I think we get stuck in this zone of beating ourselves up like, oh, I did something wrong. I did something wrong. And like, what did I do to do this? And and, and we're like taking a beating stick and beating ourselves over the head because we're seeing something we don't like in our current reality versus having the stance of this is an opportunity to deepen what you do want and understand what you don't want. And that having less attachment to whatever is happening in your world and you being wrong or bad for it manifesting in your life. Yeah. We've talked about that a lot, how we Mm -hmm. beat ourselves up and this is a perfect example of it. Uh, or, or, that's much an example because we aren't really giving an example. We're, we're talking g- generically at this point, but it's a perfect uh, category for that that concept of beating ourselves up. Because 
I, I, I mention that because when we talk about beating ourselves up, I think most of us kind of skip over the ways that we do it. You know, we, we can consciously address that, yeah, we tend to do that, and then we instantly blank it out. You know? Totally. So, so it's everybody else who's doing it. It's not me. I'm not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> and when I do it, I, I, I chastise myself for it, but, but only for a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, only for just a microsecond, and then I'm over it. But we yes. forget all of the other times where mm. you were it, like looking at the problem or the curveball that came into your life with such frustration and anger and you know, stewing over it and thinking about it over and over again in your mind, replaying it. That's also part of the beating yourself up process. It is. And, and it's, I, it's also important to remember, I think, that even though we do that, that's still okay. Yeah. See, there's still no right or wrong going on here. Yeah. We, no. we, we, we tend to talk about these things and hear these things and we say, well, okay, I beat myself up. That's really wrong. I shouldn't do that. No, that's not the point at all. <laughs> no, now you're beating yourself up about beating, you're yourself, beating up. yourself up. Yes, <laughs> it's like this vicious cycle of I get it, it's it's this vicious cycle of trying to be perfect, mm. which no one is. There is no. nobody on this planet, maybe no one in the universe, probably <laughs> that is is perfect. Maybe in the universe that is perfect. I I think we have a distorted view of what is perfect and how we're yes. supposed to walk through this journey that is life. And I think that the curveballs make everything sweeter. You know, when you're in it, it sucks. Oh, yeah. You know, it's hard to see the forest through the trees, all of those cliches. And there's a lot of emotion that goes into mm-hmm. going through things. But I have to genuinely say, Walt, that every single thing that I've ever been through that was hard, that I thought was going to take me out, when I walked through that journey on the other side was something beautiful whether it was me changing or my perspective of the world changing or, you know, just having gratitude for getting to the other side, there was always a reason and it was always better. And truthfully, the only, re- <clears throat> the only reason that it takes so long to get through to the other side is that we stop within the, the place that's not so wonderful to, this is an ironic thing I'm saying, sort of a sarcastic thing I'm saying, to admire the view. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, they, they, well, I'm going to get really upset about this thing, so I'm just going to stay here for a while. <laughs> I want to be mad. <laughs> yes, right. I want to be right that my life sucks right now. Yes, that's, yes. You know, that's interesting because that's a, a question my dad would ask me on uh, early on in my life. What do you want to be right about? Mm. And Good question. You know, it's it's a, such a great question. You know, what do I want to be right about? And 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 allowing yourself to be mad, that mm-hmm. was a huge one for me to learn because I thought I had to get to the other side of like I got to feel positive. So if I'm feeling negative right now, I got to get got to hurry up and get to that other side and shift. And and I would beat myself up. For well, not which is interesting there. because it's the other way around. You have to shift before you can get to the other side. <laughs> Right? Yeah, it's in that process that you are shifting, that you are Mm -hmm. learning, that all of these things are happening. But sometimes when I was really stuck on a problem, I would try the shift method. Like that, Mm -hmm. if, you know, Tony Robbins talks about it, just shift your state. You know, Joe Spenza talks about it and I would get stuck there, like trying to shift, like with all of my might. Let me just Mm -hmm. like force myself to be happy and and i i couldn't and and sometimes it's too far it's just too far out of reach absolutely we've talked about that before but something that really empowered me was giving myself permission to be mad Mm -hmm. so instead of you know now the way that i walk through curveballs is a little bit different (laughs) when i am pissed off i ask myself are you ready to feel something different and sometimes the good answer question. is no. Very right? good question. I like that. Right? Because sometimes yeah. you just want to be mad. Mm-hmm. And I I found that out about myself. I just wanted to be mad or I just wanted to be sad. Yeah. And it sounds stupid. But the more I tried to delay that and just shift into something else, the longer those feelings that I didn't like kept going and building and taking over everything else. So that was the question that I started to ask myself. Am I ready to shift to something else? And if the answer was no, I respected that of it myself. Makes okay. it, makes, it makes total sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Be- because so. if, if you 
if the idea is to work all the way through a negative state, a negative emotion, mm -hmm. then when we say something that is inconsistent with that, we're basically putting up the block. Yeah. So, so the moment that we're saying to ourselves, well, I need to shift right now because I'm feeling miserable is the moment that we're saying, I don't want to walk, walk through the emotion. <laughs> I don't Absolutely. want to finish it. Yeah. And, I don't and want to say that it. we say, I'm going to continue to stay here because that's really what the net result is. Yes. I've yeah. determined and I'm not going to experience it. So therefore I experience it. Yeah. And you're invalidating yourself mm -hmm. by doing that, by just trying to ignore those feelings and to shift to something else. You're saying that part of you that feels mad right now is irrelevant or mm -hmm. doesn't matter. And you would never do that to your best friend. Say, oh, get over it. <laughs> they might not be your friend for long if you That's did. Right. That's right. right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something, though, because uh, we were mentioned earlier how nobody's perfect. There's another way I like to look at the same idea. I like to look at it that we're already perfect. Mm. We don't really have to prove anything. Yeah. It, we don't have to, to okay, I, I am now in this rough state, so I have to do the perfect thing at this point. No, you're already doing the perfect thing. Yeah. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Yeah. I like which, that. Which is sometimes, it depends on what your psychology is. For some people, that's going to be a harder concept. Mm -hmm. For other people, it's going to be easier. You know, so you mm -hmm. have to kind of decide for yourself, does it work for me? Yeah. But I, I Sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't work for me, but I kind of generally like to think that I'm always perfect with everything yeah. just so I can take the pressure off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That one's helped me a lot too. Yeah, that's good. You know, what's interesting to you, Walt, is a lot of times um, there's, well, all, I would say every time um, okay. when we're feeling <laughs> these things, it's coming from a meaning that we've created or something that we're stuck on. So let me follow or like walk through a pattern, you know, like I want to be mad. Okay. What do you want to be mad about? I want to be mad that he ripped me off or he did me wrong or she did me wrong or, you know, whatever, apply it to the, your specific situation that you're going through, but that they ripped me off. Okay. And so, so what N now what, like, what does that mean? That means that I'm right. Ah, yes. <laughs> and a lot of people can't get past that. Yeah. They don't even get to that conversation with themselves. But if they forgive or if they let go of those feelings, that anger, that pain, whatever, then it means that they're wrong or that they're justifying what somebody else has done. And that that's not true. <laughs> it doesn't have to be true. It, it's, it's funny. This, mindset that we get stuck in it is it's funny because the um the whole i i I've, have really come to appreciate this fact over time i was one many years ago who would think about everything in terms of right or wrong good or bad mm -hmm. and i've since come to realize particularly since doing the show with so many great people like yourself that i i was basically killing myself every time that i took that position and I, I now look at it like, my God, I don't ever want to have anything to do with right or wrong again, because all it's ever done is made me miserable and mm -hmm. made other people miserable. I, I can't honestly say I've ever heard of a story where somebody was either proven right or proved somebody else wrong, and they end up happy at the end. Have you? No. I it's usually a win-lose situation. One person's winning, one person's losing. And, and, and that's the best result. Yeah. Because the, actually, the more common result is they both lose. Yeah. Absolutely. And right or wrong is a perspective mm -hmm. because you change your seat in the way that you're, you're sitting in that scenario. And it could be an, a, the opposite shift. What you thought was right. It now looks wrong. It's all about perspective. Now, when we go through these curveball y moments where <clears throat> things throw us off and all of a sudden we're feeling mad or frustrated or irritated or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. when we're in those moments, one of the things that we all tend to, to do, well, that most of us tend to do, I don't want to draw a, a perfect blanket statement here. Most of us tend to reach out to a friend or a relative or you know, a trusted colleague or something like that yeah. for support, and which is a wonderful thing to do. In fact, we talked often here on the show, I think I've talked with you too, about how valuable it is to have a strong, deep, extensive social network um, mm -hmm. in a variety of different ways. And this is one of the ways where it really pays off. Uh, but there's an interesting dichotomy. On the one hand, it depends 
on what kind of social network you have. And by kind, I mean what kinds of people are at the nexus, the, you know, the core of your of your social network, the ones that you would tend to reach out the most. What's, what 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 are their uh, their qualities? What are their interests? How do they tend to look at things in life? How do they tend to think about things? Mm-hmm. And the reason I mention this is this to me is what goes to the to the core of whether or not your social network is a deep quality network. Yeah. Uh, there are many people who have as their close confidence, uh, uh, confidence who are basically just as positive or negative as they are. And depending on how negative it can be, because 80% of our thoughts tend to be negative across the board on average, you can basically get somebody who's reinforcing all your negativity for you, which is, that's challenging. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, basically, you, you go on to your, your best friend or your, uh, your relative or your colleague or whatever, you know, your therapist, whatever it might be. And you've gone to that person and you, you've told them this, there's this terrible thing going on. And the other person keeps coming back to you with how terrible the thing is. Not that they shouldn't do that. I'm just saying it, it depending on their orientation, depending on their mindset, that may be what they always want to do. In fact, they may want to get into the blame mode or, you know, blaming the person or the thing or whatever it is that that's pissing you off. Yep. And that, that to me is the difference between great support and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Give me a second. I'm going to have it. <laughs> uh, not empowerment. It's, um, it doesn't mean empowerment. Uh, it's where one person, uh, reinforces somebody else's negative trend. I can't think of what that's called. The word like just, recreating or reseeding it for them, that pattern. Now, that, well, there's a specific word that comes out of therapeutic circles. Mm. And it, it means that I, in a sense, negatively empower you by reinforcing your, your thing there over and over and over again. Why can't I think of that word? Just, I mean, listeners are probably getting their emails open so they can send me a message about what that word is. They know, they're like, I know what that one is. Is it disempowering <laughs> or no? Well, yes, yeah, it's a disempowering kind of, of idea. Yeah. It's um enabling, enabling. Oh. Enablers, yes. So you have supporters and you have enablers. Yeah. And a lot of people who are the close confidants are enablers. Mm-hmm. The enabler, what, what an, an enabler, say in a, a drug addiction, I mean, obviously there's lots of different kinds of things, but you know, drug, drug addiction, an enabler basically without necessarily mean to ends up encouraging the addict to continue, continue to be an addict, you know, or perhaps they deliberately do because they're a drug pusher, but it's somebody who is basically continuing to feed the, the need for the pain relief that leads to the drug abuse in the first place. Yeah. Well, the same thing can occur in other areas of life too. So, um, if, uh, I don't know, if, if you're, you got fired and you, you go to your best friend about it and your best friend, uh, is, wants to be so sympathetic that he or she is just lambasting the boss, how stupid the boss was for doing that. And you know, you know, just on and on and on and on. They're basically just enabling you to, to feel sorry for yourself that you got fired. Yeah. On the other hand, a supporter, will say, wow, that's really terrible that the boss did that. But then the supporter will find a way to change the subject or change the picture or or shift it in some way. Yes. Because you were talking a moment ago, I, I don't think you call it pivoting, but about trying to make that shift. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it, it, it can be really hard, if you, especially if you're deep, deep down into the, the, the despair, depression era, area. Yeah. It can be really hard to make that kind of a shift. But a friend who is a supporter, a true supporter, can help you make that shift by pointing out, well, keep this in mind. Mm-hmm. You know, remember how that goes. Yes, the boss treated you terribly, but on the other hand, we also know that this can lead to something better, or you know, whatever it is, whatever the silver lining is that the uh, yeah. uh, the friend or the the colleague is, is bringing up. That's the difference. The difference between empowering, uh, not empowering, enabling and supporting. Mm-hmm. And I think that depending on where you are at that moment will determine your choice of of which one you're going to choose. Mm. Because what I've found with a lot of, um, and I've done this too, a lot of, pe- of people who have done a lot of personal development mm-hmm. is that when somebody's going through something, they will automatically start trying to help them shift the perspective. Mm. And what I learned from just dealing with my co- coaching clients and dealing with friends and stuff like that is you have to feel that they're ready to move from that feeling 
on to something else. Mm-hmm. Just like we were talking about, you could ask them that question. Are you ready to feel something else? Mm-hmm. But it's a feeling. I never asked that question before. It was more of an intuitive feeling of, okay, I need to support them right now in feeling what they're feeling, all of the garbage and like, that sucks. They need somebody that's, you know, mad with them in the trenches. And then at some point, they're going to be ready to see a new perspective. And I remember saying this to my, one of my really good friends. She was just curveball, something happened, and she was just upset. And I started to give her a perspective shift and I could feel her resistance to it. Mm, so I stopped. Mm. And in that moment I said, um, you know, friend, when you're ready, I'm here to give you all the perspective shifts, but I'm going to respect that you're feeling crummy right now. And that's where you want to be at this moment. You're not ready to move from that place. I'll sit with you in the trenches and just be here with you as you feel it. But when you're ready, I've got another perspective for you. So you let me know. And it was very liberating for her to, to feel her feelings, but also know that I was there to support her on the other side when she was ready to and not force her into trying to move when I felt it was appropriate and when she wasn't ready. Yeah. That's what a good coach or a good therapist does or a psychologist. They, they, I mean, and, and you're one, you're in that same, um, grouping, uh, they, they, they learn how to kind of take a reading of a person. I mean, the yeah. way you were describing it, you were describing it in terms of a literal verbal exchange, which is a great way to do it, but it's not the only thing. I mean, they're, nope. well, th- depending on what the situation is, sometimes it's pretty obvious to the coach or the therapist, which way they have to go on it. Yeah. Um, but very often they just do it based on what are they getting from the person? Just what's the emotional vibration that they're getting? Exactly. Uh, That's Because we're putting out vibes all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when we're feeling miserable about something. Yeah. And you can feel it. The words that you're saying to somebody, you can feel when they're, when they're receiving them or when they're rejecting them. This is all energy. You can feel all of this. And you know, if you're, if someone's listening right now and they have no idea what we're talking about, Mm -hmm. start paying attention in your exchanges when you're sitting next to someone, feel into their energy, you know, is that mine? Is that not mm. mine? What are they feeling? Just participating with your energy. And the more that you do this and work with this skill, the more you'll build the skill and you'll be able to read people without them saying anything. We have a few people listening on the live stream, including Jeffrey, who's a longtime listener. He says, you have to meet people where they are. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely, Jeffrey. That's exactly where it is. Well, because the other side of that too is when you don't, again, you're invalidating everything that they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, eventually when you do that enough to somebody, they stop going to you. And maybe that's why the inner circle tends to be enablers versus this kind of support that we're describing for a lot of people because they feel invalidated or that they're not being heard or, you know, that they don't have the right. That's another thing. They don't have the right to feel their feelings with everything that's going on in the world. Something that's come up over the last few years that I've heard multiple people say, and I have felt this internally, is I don't have the right to feel bad. Because my life isn't that bad in comparison to fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. You could always find someone who's got it worse than you. Mm-hmm. And, and society, I guess, is invalidating that your, whatever it is that you're going through is now so minuscule in comparison to world hunger or, you know, war or, or whatever it may be. And I think that's a dangerous slope. Well, it's, it's, it's actually a misuse of a very useful tool. Mm-hmm. The, the, the useful tool is if you want to make a shift and you want to understand how to, to make changes in yourself, it's very valuable to know how to look at it from the perspective of a, of a far away 10,000 foot view and just yeah. see it as in a different way. That's a really valuable tool. Yeah. It's not valuable when you're trying to do it the way you were describing it, which is yeah. basically that it, it isn't use the tool to change. It's use the tool to stay stuck. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Or beat yourself up over feeling bad about something. You know, Mm. I shouldn't feel bad about this. I have no right to feel bad. There's, you know, people that are dying because they're hungry and women, you know, in cages, sex traffic. Like, there's horrible things that are happening in our world. Sure, absolutely. Um, But it doesn't invalidate how you're feeling in this moment with whatever it is. That's still true. Both can be true at once. Yeah, that's right. Mm. 
It, this whole thing just reminds me again how important perspective is. We've talked about perspective a lot. Um, it, because, well, there, there are really two aspects to perspective. One, there's your own perspective, which is what I was just referring to, but there's mm-hmm. also the value in external perspectives. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where I want to get back to your social connections again. Because the question I would want to ask anybody who kind of suspects that maybe some of their support network are enablers, the thing I'd want to, to ask them is, if you were in a bad situation or if you have been in a bad situation and you went to them for support and you got the kind of enabling kind of support, is that really what you wanted? I mean, like you said, in that moment, maybe it seemed like it did, but the funny thing about enabling is it doesn't actually help you get better. No. So is that really what you wanted? I mean, it, it's yeah, a tough question you because know, you want, right? like, I mean, you, yeah. you were describing very well how, you know, you, you have that enabler relationship and, you, well, you kind of want that. You, 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 you're kind of feeling that you want it. I think that I'm kind of describing the process of what happens as people begin to realize, well, okay, this is okay for a while, but this is like stretching on. Mm-hmm. It, it does, nothing seems to be getting better. Yeah, I've been, I've been venting. Lots, well, amazing how many Facebook groups, by the way, are dev- devoted to venting. It's like mm-hmm. a big, big deal. Lots of, lots of support groups are all about the, doing the venting. But at some point, the venting gets to be a bit much. Yeah. At some point, you gotta stop. You gotta want to change something. Mm-hmm. You're either gonna, you know, be stuck in being helpless. Mm -hmm. or you're going to empower yourself to choose something different, even if it's just a new perspective. And it can be be confusing too, Mm -hmm. because you're still feeling that depending on how, I mean, if it's a relatively mild crappy thing, there are degrees of crappiness. You do realize that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) If it's a mild crappy thing, well, you know, okay, that, that, you know, there's lots of ways you can handle that. If you're in a really, really horrible crappy thing, now all of a sudden you're feeling torn. You know, if, especially if you're somebody who does want to do self-development, because on the one hand, you want to do something, you want to put those tools to use, right? On the other hand, you're feeling really, really crappy and you, you need to honor the really crappy. And it's, it's a, it's a torn feeling. Yeah. You're being pulled in two directions at once. That, that's where I find confusion comes in. Mm-hmm. Cause you're not really sure what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how much fear plays into it. Well, like probably a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, well, what I'm thinking of is the fear of feeling your feelings at the well, depth yeah. that you can, you can feel them. And I'm not sure if I've ever told this story here. Um, but when I went through my first ectopic pregnancy, there was mm-hmm. a lot of emotion there, like, mm-hmm. you know, losing a baby and then, you know, it's different for my husband than it is for me. And, um, and it was a mess. Like I just thought I was miscarrying and then it, then I went to the hospital with pain and, and they were like, Oh yeah, you're just missing it somehow. We're going to give you these pills. Oh no, wait, we're going to send you to a different hospital. And thank God they did or else I would have died. So mm-hmm. there, it was very close to my life being over. And I really mm-hmm. felt that. And I was yeah. in a really dark place That's right. I wouldn't, I was suspended in exactly what you were feeling, knowing I've got all of these tools and I can move. I know how to move out of these things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm angry. I'm frustrated. I'm confused. I'm, you know, feeling all this sorrow and, and you guilt. Did I do something wrong? Like there was just so many emotions there. I would wake up every day crying. I would just cry, but I didn't really know what I was crying about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I would just cry because it would all of a sudden be a sensation and I just needed to get it out of my body. So I would cry. And I remember my friend and I didn't even know that this was happening. I thought that I was dealing with my feelings pretty okay, but I was just really depressed Mm -hmm. and not really knowing how to talk about it or feel it or, or anything. Cause it's, People don't talk about that kind of stuff. And I remember my one friend calling me and I was laying on the couch and she was like, how are you doing? And I'm like, yeah, pretty good. And she's like, no, seriously, Jody, how (laughs) are you doing? And I'm like, I, I'm, I'm okay. And she's like, all right, like, how is, how is the process of feeling your feelings? Cause you know, I teach on this. (laughs) Right, right. And I said, it just came out of me. I'm afraid. 
And she's like, what do you mean? And I said, I'm afraid that if I actually sit down and feel all of them, because I was feeling like a baby portion, I would allow myself Mm. to feel a little bit, but I knew that there was so much grief there and so much, so much pain sitting right there. I thought, and I said this to her, if I feel all of this, I will never come back. It's Mm. a dark, deep whole and I will get lost and I will never come back from the feeling. And I started to cry. Yeah. And she said, yes, you will. Of course you will. How many people are watching you right now? Cause everybody, when you go through an experience like that, like it's all eyes on you for the people that love you. And mm-hmm. they're all like with kid gloves, like, is she okay? Is she not yeah, right. okay? Like, you know, trying not to step over a boundary or whatever right. and give you space, but they're all worried about you. And I could feel that from everybody because I feel everybody else's stuff just as greatly as I feel my own. So I could feel everybody was worried, but I was worried that if I felt it, I would never come back and I would just, I don't know, end up in the hospital, like a basket case. I don't know. I just thought I would be lost. And she said, I promise you that we've got you. We're all surrounding you. It's okay to feel it. And if you get lost, we'll bring you back. Wow. And yeah. That's that was a free moment. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to feel it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't get lost either. It was so interesting. As soon as I gave myself that permission to feel all of those feelings and whatever that looked like, messy or ugly or (laughs) whatever it was going to look like, I just gave myself full permission and, and had that belief that I would, I would be pulled back if I went too far or if I was lost. And as soon as I gave myself that permission, it was like, boom, I felt all of the feelings at like rapid fire pace and they moved through me so quickly. Wow. Yeah. Really good. Really good. It's interesting too, because I think probably what you described is probably the more common way that people experience pain. You know, you, 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 were, you kind of felt a little bit of it. You were reluctant to go any further. Um, and you were afraid that it would, uh, be a, a permanent ending of some kind, mm-hmm. um, possibly even to your life. But there's also the other way that, that people can become afraid of it. And, uh, I, I know I've experienced this. You can actually be facing this horrible event, whatever it is, and you feel that those negative feelings just welling up inside of you and they're so overwhelming. And you can actually decide if you don't feel them, you're going to be ended. You, you, you can actually come to the same conclusion with the opposite, um, mm. the opposite strategy. <laughs> yep. Yep. But I probably would have. It's so interesting. I never thought about that. But I was stuck in this, I don't know, like numbness Mm. where I was like, what's the point? I don't even care. I don't know what I want to do. I just want to be a mom. (laughs) Like I just was so, I don't even know what the word is, but just like, meh, just almost like dead inside, if you will. Like I was so numb that I wasn't feeling anything. So it would have been the end. I think mm-hmm. of a lot of things if I wouldn't have felt it. Like it was, it was a fine line for sure. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. it may have something to do too with how much pain is actually getting through. Cause I mean, what you described there, it almost sounds like you had to some degree managed to already numb yourself. So you, you didn't have to feel it yeah. for that moment. Um, which is, which is a kind of a danger zone all by itself. Whereas I know I've been in situations where the pain was so great. There was no way that I could numb it. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't drink alcohol or take drugs or anything. So, I, I mean, that wasn't even an option. But even if I had done that, I still, I know I still couldn't have numbed it in, in many cases yeah. just because it doesn't do that. That's why people become addicts because they're continually trying to mask the pain and it doesn't work. So they got to take more. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so that's the, the interesting, um, dichotomy, if you will, how much pain is coming through. And at what point the, does the pain seem like it's so overwhelming that you have to go through it, even though you really dread the idea of going through it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's going to be different in every case. So that's why we're sitting here saying, well, what's the, what's the answer? I, it depends. <laughs> I think it depends on you, like yeah. you as the individual, because pain is so individual, Mm -hmm. you know, like we could walk through the exact same experience of curveball, tough Mm -hmm. stuff, you know, whatever. Right. And for you, it might be a walk in the park. And Mm -hmm. for me, it might be devastating. Yeah. Yeah. The same event. 
the same exact event. Yes, that's where perspectives once again play a role. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Dang perspectives, they come up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they're so valuable much, much of the time, but then you get something like this and all of a sudden, like, I don't really want that perspective. Get that one out of here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> ah, not that one. No, no. Cause we don't like to feel pain. Who, I mean, really, nobody really likes to pay, feel pain. Well, maybe there are true masters. I never really convinced myself of that. Maybe yeah. there are true people, truly people who really love feeling pain. Maybe I haven't really bought into that one yet. Yeah. But, do you think there are? I know for myself that there's been times in my life where I felt worthy of punishment. Hmm. AKA okay, I could see that. Worthy of the pain. Yeah. So I, I could buy that where I just felt like worthless or, or worthy of bad stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Whether, you know, like that was. I don't believe that was true actually. Um, mm-hmm. but that's where my mindset was, is I deserve horrible things to happen. And therefore I expect them to happen and, you know, they're going to happen and I thrive in those scenarios, I guess. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> yeah. but you did, did you actually want, did you actually love the idea of feeling the pain though? No, I don't think no, so. I don't think so. No. In fact, I would suggest, now, here's an interesting question for you. We've heard about, you know, yogis and gurus and so forth who manage to get to the point where they say they embrace the pain, they're they're glad to have it, and in so doing, they basically move through it quickly, and so yeah. it doesn't hardly touch them at all. Mm-hmm. So it turns out that when you really love the pain, it goes away. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, and I think that that is true. When you're embracing that pain, you're allowing for it. That's exactly what happened in my experience with that story that I was telling is as soon as I allowed myself to embrace it or I embraced it, however you want to put it, it was like whoosh and everything went through me and it was very fast. I, for me, I can see beauty in the pain. It's not Mm. all pain. It's not Mm. just black. I realized that and it was during that time of, of darkness and feeling my feelings. I could start to see that I related to colors and I don't know if this makes any sense, but that they were all connected and they were all of one, like all of the colors are built up on all of the colors, if Mm -hmm. you will. So Mm -hmm. to have all of this brightness in my life, also meant that there was darkness too, or that dark color. So maybe the emotion was the same, that this was going to be a part of the good. The bad was going to be a part of the good. And I I could be okay with that. I could love that it brought me to that place. I don't know if that makes sense. Jeffrey, I don't know if you saw Jeffrey in the live stream asked, was that feeling coming from guilt or shame? Which feeling? I think tied to uh, the ectopic pre- pregnancy. Uh, the feeling of not feeling it. Yeah. Like not wanting to feel it. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my mother really where it came from is my mother has a history of mental illness and she's ended up in the hospital several mm-hmm. times where they thought she would never come back from it. So for me, I thought I don't, I had it connected in my mind that if I really felt all of these feelings that I would get lost in those feelings and then I would end up in the hospital like she was. That was my real fear is that I wouldn't be able to handle all of the emotion. And there was definitely guilt in there. There was definitely shame. There was every feeling that you can imagine (laughs) going through all of that. A lot of anger, confusion, like, I feel like there was a rainbow <laughs> of feelings. <laughs> that, that's actually a good description. I, I think that that can be true whether you're high vibe or low vibe, but I think it's especially true when you're really low vibe mm-hmm. because when you're in that place, it's not, I mean, we, we often try to label it. No, I'm depressed. I'm, I'm in despair. I'm raging or whatever it is. But in truth, it's usually a mixture. Yeah. It's never, it, it's rarely, I mean, when it gets to the point where it's one really clear, solid feeling, that means you've worked through most of it. Yeah. But earlier on, it's like, it seems to be all of them, all kind of all this of great big soup. Yeah. And I think further to, to Jeffrey, your question, I think that guilt and shame was keeping me stuck and not feeling it. 
because it was the guilt of feeling those feelings. Like, why can't I just bounce back? Because watching my husband, he had a very different experience, right, wrong, indifferent. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But as soon as I got pregnant, I felt things change within mm. my body. Like mm. I planned out the next, you know, 40 years of this kid's <laughs> life before like, you know, you pee on the stick. Like I knew yeah. so everything changed for me. But it wasn't his experience. So, I mean, yes, he was sad and, and he was dealing with his emotions and stuff like that. Um, but I seem to be taking it way harder than he was. And I, so I really felt guilt that I couldn't handle my emotions and, and shame as well of not being able to handle those emotions. That kind of was the perspective I was sitting at. Like if I, if I go off the deep end and I can't handle all of this, then I'm a bad wife and I'm a bad person and I'm not a very good coach. Like there was all of this stuff inside of that. I, I love the way you described how you just knew and how you just knew. Mm-hmm. I, I, Cause I can recall, especially when I was young, how, uh, the, the topic that was popular at the day, during the day, during that day, uh, about women was women's intuition. Well, somehow women have an intuition that men don't have. And very often it was tied into things like childbearing. And, you know, you, you, you'd hear a woman say, well, I just knew I was pregnant. I just knew that something was going on. And, and if you're a male and you've never had that experience, or if you're prepubescent female and haven't had that experience, you say, well, how do you know? And they could never give you an answer. I just, I just knew. I just knew. But, but you were able to, to give us some sense of it. You know, I could, you, I could feel changes going on in my body even before I peed on the stick. Like you, you, you were describing how there, there was a physical sensation in many different ways going on that was telling you, Hey, guess what? You're carrying a, 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 a fetus here. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's, I think that's really great. The more that's, you get for, to for, know for your... the males, I think it's great to hear that because yeah. we, we don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's what it was with my husband too, is like, I mean, he was watching me, I was a little bit sick and you know, whatever. Right. But I never vocalized all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that I've been learning as well as, you know, he's having a completely different experience than I am (laughs) with all things. Yeah, sure. Now Jeffrey has a follow-up question. He says, did it help you connect to your mother and empathize, maybe forgive a little anger or confusion? Hmm. It, It helped me have, um, more understanding mm-hmm. and, and definitely empathy for her. Just, I think going through that experience and how difficult it was made me have more, um, more respect for women <laughs> and what they go <laughs> through. Yeah. So my mother included all of those things. And I think, you know, just having the ability to go through those feelings and she was there for me at that time. Um, during all of that, she was so worried about me and just, we were actually living in their yard at the time oh, in our really? holiday trailer. Yes. Wow. <laughs> so she'd come over for, you know, um, coffee in the morning and make mm-hmm. me lunch. And she was so nurturing. So I got nice. to see a completely different side of her as wow. well. So it definitely helped helped me work through all of that and obviously some 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 subconscious beliefs that I was going to have mental issues because she did you know it's it's genetic or whatever mm-hmm. obviously that was sitting somewhere subconscious is that I would I would have I would have those the same not issues but I would have the same um genetics or or go through the same things and handle it the same way and yeah, so it, it did help me connect with her and empathize more with all of the things that she's been through. Jeffrey followed up by saying the thought in my head is expanded capacity. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Expanded capacity to go through pain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Expanded mm-hmm. capacity to stand up for myself because I really had to, mm-hmm. um, during that, those times at the hospital and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, just even allowing myself to feel those feelings and feel safe to do so. Mm-hmm. Now I have that capacity to do that for others too. Cause I know that I'm going to be okay. Cause I've been through it. Isn't that interesting? When you go through something, I mean, we've seen this all the time. You, you've mm-hmm. seen some of it too in the time that you've been on here, guests coming on the program who go through some kind of crash and burn. And at the end, they feel like, well, okay, now I know how to help somebody else get through it. 
they yeah. become a coach in some way or, you know, at least a, a mentor or an advisor or something like that, or they write a book about it. It, it. It's almost like it's a universal response, right? You experience something rotten. You say, wow, I really want to help somebody else if, if they are going through the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Give them a new perspective. Yeah. There was so much I learned through that time. Like as much as it hurt to go through all of that, yeah. I am so grateful, so incredibly grateful because I learned a lot about myself and how I operate and how my husband operates and just, I got to feel, I, 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 I think that it's true when people say like the depth that you can feel joy is connected to the depth that you've been able to feel pain. Like it's mm-hmm. that swinging pendulum. And I feel that, that expanded capacity as Jeffrey said, oh, thanks for the heart, Jeffrey. Going to. <laughs> um, but I, I felt that cause I felt like I swung so far in that one direction of pain is so much pain. But since that moment, if I look at my life, the amount of joy and bliss, abundance, like love, the capacity that I've had for those things has been 10 X what it was before that point. It's funny because I know I have kind of a, I have mixed feelings about the whole pain joy thing. That, yeah. That, so that, do I. <laughs> well, I think we all do, I guess. But, but for me, the mixed feeling is, it's almost, I won't say it's resentment. It's not resentment. It, it's, it, I don't have a good word for it. It's a word that means really I have to go through pain every time I want to get to a place of better joy. <laughs> no, I, maybe it's not mutually exclusive. Mm. Maybe it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, I'm not really sure. All I know is no. that, that it, it's an issue that I continue to wrestle with, just yeah. trying to come to terms with it and just appreciate that that's, that's usually my, my objective these days. You know, when I encounter something that's painful, you know, I, I want to find some way to use my tools yeah. to just, you know, how, how well can I move through this thing? Yeah. Well, what if, what if on the other side, the joy side, there, that same fear exists of like losing yourself or, mm. you know, that maybe guilt. I shouldn't be this happy. People around me mm. aren't that happy. Oh boy. You know, like maybe some of those things that stop me, for example, in feeling that pain also stop me on the other side. Cause everything is the same. Like how you do one thing is how you do yeah. all things. So in my, my situation, I was probably stopping myself at a certain point in terms of oh. allowing myself to feel joy and bliss and abundance and, and all of those things that we desire to feel. So if you could figure out what's stopping you from opening your heart more on that side, maybe you don't have to experience pain. Yeah, I would think that would be true. The, I mean, you still, we still need to have in this universe anyway. Uh, and, and from what uh, we've been told here on the show by, you know, the stream and, and others, it's not the only way that things are done in mm-hmm. the energetic realm. But this universe is all about the polarity. It, it's about the, the, like you were talking about before, the light and the dark, you know, the, the, the joy and the pain. And within that context, it's, it is both a challenge and a joy to deal with the pain and it, it's the way the thing is built. But when I think about what you just said, well, maybe you can just kind of, I don't remember how you said it exactly, but you can just kind of get to that, get beyond your, your limits, so to speak, and, and appreciate the joy in some way like that. I, I guess what I'm, I'm getting to is I'm thinking about what source perspective is. Mm-hmm. Because from every, what everybody has told us who has talked about source perspective, perspective, source perspective always views all this with love. Yes. Continuously, totally, totally never shifting, never changing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, in order to do that, in order to do that, you have to love all of it. You have to and love all to love, of it. You have to love all of it. And in order to love all of it, you have to appreciate it all. And in order to appreciate it all, you have to appreciate the bad, the good, everything in between. Yep. The rotten, the horrible feeling, wonderful feeling. You have to appreciate all of it continuously. Yeah. Which 
you know, for, for us living in the physical world, that, that's too, too much of a mind stretch. We haven't got that far. <laughs> I started to look at it like a video game because when I remove myself from the scenario and I start thinking about some of the things that I've been through and whatever it's, or it's kind of like a movie or a video game, mm. you know, like you love watching movies or I love watching movies. I shouldn't speak for you, but I <laughs> love watching movies like the, you know, heartbreak that the char- character goes through and then, you know, that they fall in love. I, I like romance novels, romance guess, movies, yeah. like things like that. You know, I love love. That's why I watch The Bachelorette. I like watching people fall in love. Okay. But, um, my husband's like, that's stupid. Um, (laughs) Uh, you know, like the, the exciting journey that they go on, the twists and turns and the drama and everything like that. It's all about the experience of all of these things. So we start to look at our own life. It's kind of the same. It's a movie that somebody that you have, not somebody that you have carefully, carefully, in my opinion, curate, curated. At some point, like I truly believe that we sit in a green room of some sorts. It probably doesn't look like that. You know, we <laughs> press a button and we're like, whoo, what's the highlight reel? You know, you watch mm. the trailer of your life. So you see all the good and all the bad and you're like, wow, what a ride. <laughs> Let's do it. And then you jump in the body and you go. And buy a ticket. <laughs> yeah, you buy a ticket. That sounds like it's such a good experience. But then once we get here and we're actually in the experience, we're so involved in it. We're so attached to it. And it's it becomes difficult to appreciate those moments. But I find stepping That's out of the frame up. and yeah. seeing the whole picture, you know, helps a little bit. It's funny when you mentioned, uh, well, it, you, you like watching movies, but uh, you wouldn't, didn't want to speak for me. I thought to myself, okay, so what, how do I feel about movies? And I realized instantly what my answer was. Um, you, you liked uh, um, uh, The Bachelorette, mm-hmm. that kind of a program. And, and that's perfectly fine. Um, for somebody like me, that, 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 that doesn't really work. And the reason it doesn't work for me, I realize, is because the only kind of movie I like is the one where the characters feel like they're living real life to me. Where it's mm. contrived. I don't, I, I, they lose me really fast in any contrived situation. Yeah. Cause I guess what goes through my mind is it's not like we lack pain in the real world. You know, yeah. why do I need to contrive something? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to go out of my way to make a new form of pain without, you know, Skipping over, by skipping over all the, the current ones that are already available to me. I guess yeah. that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Like, you know, we, what, we don't have enough of a selection so far? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's like a conversation I had with a stream one time. Um, because I, I don't remember what the context was exactly, but somehow, um, we were on this, this whole topic of the polarity and so forth and how, um, it, it's so important to appreciate uh, the dark so that you can appreciate the light and so forth. Um, and, and that really wouldn't be good to be living in a world where it was all light. Um, not, that's not what the stream said, but that was kind of like where it was going toward. Um, if, if you, if I had pinned the stream down, the stream would have said, would not have said no, or I'm sorry, it would have said that no, it, we're not saying that it's bad to, to be feeling good all the time because, you know, in pure source energy, you love everything. So you're feeling that all the time, right? That's just, yeah. that's what you're doing. Um, but the thought that kept going through my mind is we, we keep hammering on all this, this, this pain stuff, all these negative situations, negative thoughts and so forth. And, and we, we also hammer on them from the perspective of, of growth. Like, well, we got to appreciate them. We got to learn from them and so forth. And the thought that kept going through my, my head is, is, is there like a, a, a polarity shortage going on? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually voiced that to the stream, which was, I, I don't even know why I did that. And I don't even remember what the answer was. Probably just a reflection back to, you know, what polarity is all about. But yeah. I, I, I thought that at times it's like, do we, it, we, we get so focused on all these negative stories, all these, these tales, experiences, lifetimes, whatever. And we, we, we get to the place where we want to, to feel really good. And all of a sudden the teachers are saying, yes, but we got to really appreciate, we appreciate, appreciate because without it, we wouldn't have this life. Mm-hmm. And that's where I think to myself, what makes you think there's, that we're ever going to lose that polarity in this world? I don't really get that. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's like put, that's creating a straw man that I don't see he'll ever actually get to. Yeah, a, a life without polarity. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. In this world, in this universe. In this world, no. It's this. That's because that's what this universe for. is designed to be. It's designed exactly. to be a world of polarity. You know, yeah. you take the polarity out, it's no longer this universe. Yeah, it's something different. We're on yeah. a different planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think different, different I, constellations. <laughs> yeah, and I think all of the beings, like all of us human beings that are here right now at this time, we came here to experience both. Mm. 
Like, we came here for a reason. Even though sometimes I say to myself, what was I thinking? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, what's, what's an interesting thought I used to have no, a number of years ago? This is a little bit off topic, but it's sort of on the same topic. I used to think, wow, it must have been really interesting during like the times of like civil war and unrest when they were like, you know, when the U.S. was going through what they were going through mm. and in Canada, it was like upper Canada, lower Canada and, oh, yeah. and all of that was going on. I, hmm, I wonder how things worked. That would be so interesting to to live that life. And and as things get crazier in our world, I think, why the frick did I say that? <laughs> What about that is appealing or yeah. interesting? I don't, I, geez, what were you seeding? Like, why? But I think uh, some part of my soul is like, yeah, I want to try that. <laughs> I remember the first time that I heard somebody to d- describe to me why it is that people like stock car racing. Yeah. That they go to the stock car races to see the crashes. Oh, yeah. And I, I first heard that and I thought to myself, boy, those people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting. It's thrilling. <laughs> ah, our motivation sometimes it's 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 really interesting. Hey, <laughs> go to the stock car races. <sighs> like, well, yet yeah, that's what what happens in so much of life. I mean, people are fascinated by all this contrasty polarity crap that yeah. goes on. Oh yeah, rubbernecking on the highway when oh, you see a yeah. car crash yeah. <laughs> cause other car crashes. Well, how much of entertainment is based on it? Yeah. I mean, like, Absol- news. Of all of it. News. Yeah. 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 Politics, religion. I mean, yeah. you, you can't, it's hard to come up with a topic that isn't inundated with it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's really interesting because we start living life for all of these other things, like these mm-hmm. external things, the car crash, the, you know, whatever. And it's, it, this dawned on me the other day because my husband is having a conversation with, guy at work and they're talking about giant pumpkins. So giant pumpkins are huge in the States. Like it's a big deal in the United States, in Canada, it's not as big of a deal, but it's starting to, but my Mm. husband and I grow giant pumpkins. Um, We're not like world record breakers or anything yet, but our highest one is like 440 (laughs) pounds. So it sounds like the gauntlet has been thrown down is what it's Oh yeah. It's happening. It is happening. (laughs) We're doing it. Well, he comes from a lineage of giant pumpkin growers, like Uh Guinness world record book, giant pumpkin growers. So, He wants to, you know, do that and it's exciting and I've bought mm-hmm. into it because it's cool, that, mm-hmm. you know, growing anything that that's, that's that big. Yeah, it's it's like, holy crap. Really cool. That, that was yeah. a seed? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Well, look at abundance right yeah, there. Right. <laughs> like it's just, it, it's in nature. I just love watching nature. So we went to this fair. It was the giant pumpkin way offs in a town that's close to us. And I guess it's sanctioned. Um, so there's only like a couple of different places in the States and in Canada where you can actually go to the official way off. And oh, okay. this place happens to be like 25 minutes, 30 minutes from our house. So we go for the official way offs. We didn't bring our pumpkins because my husband was like, no, no, they're too small. They would have ranked top 10. Wow. On that pumpkin way off for sure. Wow. Probably like seven, eight. So we had Not some bad. sizes yet, but the one that was there, the big one, the one that one or all took, uh, it took the Canadian record this year of 25, I think it's 37, 2,500 pounds, 2,537. What? 2,537 pound pumpkin. Ex- exactly. This thing is wow. a beast. Huge. Wow. It's amazing. So my husband and this guy are having this conversation at work and he's like, like what? Why would somebody do that? Like, why? <laughs> what's the motivation? Like, I don't understand. Like, what's the point of growing a giant pumpkin? And Nate looked at him and he was like, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, uh, he's like, no, seriously, like you're, you're bashing on this guy because he's spent his time. You know, I, I don't know if the guy is retired or whatever, but that he, he broke a record. He's in all of these newspapers and like he was beaten out marginally by somebody in the States, um, over the last couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the next, uh, so I guess the second highest now with the official way offs is 2550. Wow. That one came in. And then I think there's one from New York that came in 2590. 
Wow. So like Amazing. barely beat him, but just beat him out. And this guy's like, I don't understand why you'd waste your time doing that. And Nate just looked at him and was like, well, what do you do with your life? Like, what, what are you, what are the accomplishments that, or like accomplishments that you're excited about in your own life? Like this guy's just jacked because he, you know, he's got the Canadian record and that's exciting to Nate. And, and you know, the guy just looked at him and was like, huh, good point. <laughs> It's a really good point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it also brings to mind too another thought. Like, do the people who do the pumpkin growing, do they have an alliance with the National Association of Jack o' Lantern Carvers? They should. <laughs> I mean, they it's totally the ultimate should. experience in carving, right? <laughs> absolutely. I I don't think so. You have to ca- carve them with like sawzaws and yeah, like. Yeah. It's it's crazy because they're the wall thickness is. It, it's just, oh, yeah. it's insane. I will send you some pictures. <laughs> I haven't even carved them. We always give them away, but yeah, there That's should be a connection wild, there. That's <laughs> really wild. I love that. Yeah. Hey, this has been fun. I mean, here we are talking again about pain. We're talking about those curveballs throwing at us, throwing at us in our, in our lives. And we had so much fun doing it. So isn't it great? We found a way through pain to laughter and to joy. Yeah. Absolutely. Pretty darn good. Thanks so much, Jody Lynn. Appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thanks Let's, for having me again. Well, I, I'm, I want you here on the show every week. Are you kidding? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs> okay. right. So it's a done deal. Okay. Yep. Next. <laughs> In the meantime, thank you all very much for listening. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.